Yeah, because I don't want to miss any good stuff. Last time we started talking before we recorded, I was like, ah, these are these should have been recorded. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, to answer your question, all the shirts behind me are, um, I collect like handmade shirts from local graffiti artists. Um, oh, so wow. by, like some of my friends. Yeah. Well, that's neat. Well, yeah. I have, I don't know if you can see the one I'm wearing. Hey! <laughs> it's blurring it. You have, oh, to, is it? you have to turn off the blurring fun uh, feature on your oh. Skype. Where's that oh, eyeball I'm oh, looking for? I saw it for a second. I saw it for a second. I think you go to Skype. That's option. Facts, not fiction. Facts, yeah. not fiction. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, like. I mean, yeah, okay, to be, fair, though, to be fair, though, I like fiction as long as we're clear that it's fiction. Yeah, but this kind of fiction <laughs> is religious fiction. <laughs> I like religious fiction, too, as long as we understand that it's fiction. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I, I like I like facts and I like fiction. I don't like fiction pretending to be fact. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> but by the way, Susanna, do you have the box next to you? Can we go over the stuff? Because I don't oh! know. <laughs> Louis, I don't know if you know, but I think you know. Susanna is ex and she's not just ex Catholic. She's also ex Antifa. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, she she has left two different cults, and she has a box wow. of memories of the things that she had when she was in Antifa, and she's also yeah, planning. To... You go on, sorry. Well, wait. I don't know if you if we're gonna record this. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, just about my plants. We got okay. to do that. Okay. No. To a bus. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Damn it. Okay. You should tell me. Okay, just for record, I'm I'm not good at assuming that things are private. So if you ever tell me thing something that is private, I know I should already assume that, but I don't. You have to tell me that this is private and this is secret while you're telling me. Okay. Well, I just don't want to reveal anything too soon. Yes. You know, I'm still I'm still plotting. I'm still formulating. Okay, okay. Um, still brainstorming and conceptualizing. So, um, but I have I have my box. Okay. Uh, Let's go through this stuff that Susanna. <laughs> this is from her so, days. Yes. Oh my god, I don't even know where to begin. Um here is something that I got from the uh party for socialism and liberation at the anti war with Iran demonstration. You know, here we have Soleimani. Um, so this was quite recent. So Susanna was like part of this, uh, part of these groups until very recently, right? Oh so, wow! Uh -huh. And you were saying, and you were saying that they were using the anti-war, anti-war against Iran as a place to recruit people. That's what I felt, anyways. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, if yeah. you, I mean, but a lot of people are like, well, what's wrong with being anti-war? I mean, I mean, that's that's not the problem with it, right? I think like you felt like they had a whole a bunch of misunderstanding about Iran and like it was like pro Qasem Soleimani. It wasn't just anti-war; it was pro a t known terrorist. It it wasn't explicitly that, hmm. but when I was there, like it was. Um, it's exclusively about American imperialism, mm. um, which I mean mm. is something that should be talked about. But in this conversation, we need to talk about Shia imperialism. We need to talk mm. about mm -hmm. what Iran yeah. is doing around the world. And yeah. when I was there, not a single there was not a single mention of the fact that American soil was attacked when. There mm. was the attack on the uh, embassy in Baghdad. Embassy. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, that wasn't mentioned a single time. No mm. one gave an F. It was like, it didn't even matter. Um, oh, my God. I saw so many people wearing Che Guevara shirts, um, which oh, always right. really, that always pisses me off so much. Yeah. Um, and next time even, I see someone. Yeah. Even back then, pissed you off? Even when you were part of Antifa? I 
Um, not as much then because I was just like a dumbass. I didn't know as much. Um, <laughs> and I mean, of course, there's still probably there's more things that I'm stupid about even now than things that yeah. I have expertise in. That's just what it is to be human, right? Yeah. Um, but you aren't really encouraged to ask questions like that. <laughs> um, oh, so and much like your religion. Oh, what a concept. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it just always really bothered me. Because I mean, even back then, like I knew that I knew a little bit about Che Guevara. Mm. Um, and even then I was like, this is weird. Like, how is he a symbol for liberation? I don't, I don't get it. Um, especially like if these are people who are for gay rights and stuff. Like, next time I see someone wearing one of those shirts, I want to go up and ask them, like, you know, oh, how do you feel about, like, homosexuality? Huh? Right. Huh? What, what's your stance? You know, should, should this even be legal? Like, what's up? And they'll right. probably be like, yeah, of course. Like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, who the... Look at your... Look here. Look right here. <laughs> like... <laughs> Wait, did he have a uh, direct anti-gay position check where? Like, did he talk about it? Like, I don't know. Like, educate. He, like, yeah. Well, I mean, okay. I'm no expert. Um, my understanding is that he was extremely homophobic. He would round up gay men to be put into labor camps. Ooh. Where, like, above wow. the title of the labor camp, it was um, said something along the lines of, like, work will make you men uh, mm-hmm. yeah so like <clears throat> that's just one thing hmm. that he did that's not cool among like many mm-hmm. others like just the outright murder of political dissidents is not that's not cool um not i don't cool. care i don't care if you're left or right that's not mm-hmm. cool <laughs> i don't know man a lot of these antifa type people might say like actually <laughs> that is cool yeah, yeah you know, no, no. they would like that yeah but you know you know how la- you i don't know if that was private or not they I don't think, think you... that the liberal protection of the individual is like overrated right yeah and a protection and, and, of fascism itself right um you know how you mentioned that um they say when they say death to america when iranians say death to america they they're only talking about the heads of states right well, that was a tweet that i saw yeah i mean technically that's true for a lot of them not all of them but that's not oh that doesn't make it okay do you know what i mean yeah. like like i think all of us here are anti-trump right all of us here yeah, right? yeah. very much so. none of us would endorse anybody wanted to like not only endorse we don't i don't think say, saying somebody like oh he only wants to kill trump we're not okay with that. We're not okay with people I saying be, like. You I remember. Be. I remember telling my brother that I wanted him to be drawn and quartered in the street. Oof. And my brother was like, <laughs> revolted, and I didn't understand why he wasn't on board. I'm just being honest. Wow. Mm-hmm. How did you? Well, it. Oh, sorry. The world would be a lot better off. Fewer people would die. <laughs> Um, I don't think the world will be better off. Do you know how much Trump's... Okay, first, it, it doesn't solve any... Like, even I wouldn't say that even about Khamenei, right? If somebody kills Khamenei, it would su- add such fuel to the fire of his fans. Same thing mm-hmm. with Trump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it's, was, it's his, his fans. But so many... Well, the political party, though, I mean, like, the senators and representatives, they don't like him. They're afraid of him. I know, and but so, if somebody shot him, it would, the world would be a worse place. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Wait, Armin, what were you going to ask me? Um, oh, I, I said, like, how did you, how does it feel to want somebody to die a painful death? Like, did you feel, I, I, I remember having some justified, I thought like I have some justified hate towards, towards people, but now when I think about those moments, I felt icky. You know what I mean? I don't feel. I don't know. I feel it doesn't feel. It doesn't feel like 
It feels as I remember the times in my life that I felt like you know people deserve to be happy, even people that I don't like deserve to be happy, even people that I hate deserve to be happy. Um, it's better to forget and forgive than you know hold a grudge. I remember my, me personally being happier when I had that attitude than when those moments of my life that I felt like you know what this person deserves to be suffer deserves to suffer. I feel like those were the moments in my life that were, when you look back at it and try to remember how you felt, it feels icky. You know, you feel, I feel icky as a person. I feel disgust, uh, disgust you know, I feel like there was some, yeah. dis, you know, how do you feel about, like, were you happy? Was that okay? I don't know. Like, how did you get there? I mean, oh my goodness. I think my perspective at the time was I thought that it had some sort of like utilitarian function. Mm. Like this will do the most good for the most people. But a quote that really sticks with me is by Lloyd Evans. And he says um, something along the lines of a utopia built on genocide will not stand. Exa oh, yeah. He, he, yeah. He's yeah. talking about the Jehovah's Witness idea of Armageddon. Mm. But it, mm -hmm. it, it it stuck with me. I was like, you're yeah, so right. Yeah. And I find anarchism to be, after all my studying, to be like wholly utopian. I don't think it's based in reality. It requires us to... Um, it's, it almost requires a denial of our innate cognitive biases as humans, which is just impossible. Mm. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, utopian. And utopian idealistic dogmas are inherently dangerous because they're not based in reality. And yeah, a lot more. Mm. How did you? I, I've never. Go ahead, you lose. Go ahead. No, I, I'm with you, Armin. I, I could never want anyone to suffer. Mm. I couldn't. I couldn't. But I could want them to not exist. <laughs> and not do the damage they were doing, but uh, not to suffer in the process. You know what? To get back to your point, Arm, about like how did it make me feel at the time and thinking back, like I didn't feel icky about it at all. But mm. when I think back, um, so I'm someone who's, I'm very moved by human connection. Um, like literally something as simple as a nonverbal child smiling at his parent could move me to tears. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. Or someone sharing music across a language barrier. Like I'm very deeply moved by just simple human connection. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. noticed the deeper I got into this mentality, I was losing that part of myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. part of myself wasn't allowed to exist anymore and that's when i knew that something was wrong seriously hmm. wrong yeah well isn't that a form of brainwashing yes and getting out of being brainwashed yes i have a lot of books on thought reform that i'm reading right now hmm. um, uh -huh. yeah. how, how did you get recruited in that in that camp in that tribe um, so it, it's never, I mean, it wasn't explicit because I mean, this is not a, um, it's not an explicit group, you know, there is no official membership. It's purposefully decentralized. Hmm. Um, and, you know, to be autonomous, to dissolve, um, consolidation of power. Um, and so that's why I say like I, I was like an affiliate or a supporter because there is no solid membership. Right. I mean, there are groups who take up anti-fascist tactics and they might have more specific membership, but just like broadly speaking. Um, so what really, well, what first set me off was the election of Trump. And then what truly radicalized me was when the fam familial separation that was happening at the southern border was brought to light in the spring and summer of June, mm. April, June 2018 <clears throat> um, because I studied psychology so in d developmental child psychology and so I knew exactly 
what yeah. that was doing to the brains of those children mm-hmm. and how they will never be the same again. And I couldn't tolerate it. I could not tolerate it. Mm. Um, and I didn't understand why the whole world wasn't freaking out. Like it, it, I, I didn't understand. I felt the need to take drastic action mm. because who else is doing it? Who, who, you know, like, um, you know, kind of this idea of if enough people just cared, we could shut this down right now, which is technically true. Mm. Um, and I, because I just didn't, I couldn't tolerate that human suffering. I just still, I can't. Um, and who else was doing something about it? Mm. How, you know, I felt desperate. Um, the, 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 I don't know how true this is, but I, I follow a lot of like Trump supporters, and what they were saying is that this is like what what would be the alternative? Like every criminal that you arrest, you're separating the parent from their child. What do you want them to do? Do you want them to like even if they're not illegal immigrants, if they're just Americans that get arrested they're going to get separate from the children like um so i don't know what the comeback to that is i'm not so yeah. in the um one of the groups that i was involved in was abolish ice and um in their writings and manifestos like what they would say is abolishing ice is the first step like that's just the first step so they would always talk about like bringing in immediately afterwards the prison industrial complex for Mm. for your exact point that you just brought up like the separation of families is already happening and it's been happening what's the option when people needs to be brought into this okay but what would be the option if you commit a crime should we imprison your child as well so you don't get separate from your or do you want no imprisonment at all for any crimes like i don't understand I mean, I have a problem with the prison system in the United States, of course, but that doesn't mean there shouldn't be any prison at all. Well, but, but this, was, this situation was quite different, wasn't it? I mean, when they were, Trump wanted to separate the kids from the parents to, to send a message to other people that were coming, you know, not to come. Well, they didn't even know what was happening. And they're not, they were, they were refugees. A lot of them were refugees. They were not just Not, coming most, for you know most of them weren't refugees most of them were economic migrants but there are other ways of handling it you that you don't have they didn't have to imprison but they did they didn't imprison all the parents sometimes they send them back right but there you there was no reason to separate them so a no lot earthly of, reason the the well i mean so, the the whole idea of using this against them to punish them was mentioned by like a couple of people. I don't know how white white that policy was, but the the way that they again I don't know if any of this is true. I just followed them and I know what their arguments are. Um, a lot of them think that this whatever methods you use to discourage them to come to the border is actually a humanitarian thing in their favor, because what they were saying is that these are people that are putting that are putting their ch- children at risk, going through a very dangerous uh, travel trip uh, and, you know, putting their own lives and their children's lives at risk in the middle of desert. And most of them are not even in danger of losing their lives. They just want better lifestyle. So they say, like, if you could somehow spread, show them what's waiting for them and discourage them from making that trip, you're actually helping them. By you know, well, okay. that's how, what how about working with the countries and trying to make the that the, is what the they countries. did. That's what they did because huh? for that's what they did. They actually managed to Trump managed to eventually help work with Mexico, uh, so that they. Well, why was he cutting off aid to so many of those other countries? It wasn't really Mexico. It was the 
it was the country yep. further south. Yeah, but it and was working with Mexico was, so that the border so that the border that they get stopped at shouldn't be the US border, it should be the Mexican border, right? So they're saying like but, if to so a Mexico but I mean but, their original countries, the countries they left. He was cutting off aid to make the conditions there worse, which would make the conditions there worse, which would stimulate more of them to to leave well, instead of trying. So he's to an increase. interesting thing. He's an interesting dilemma. Like why do so? If when you say they're cutting off aid, people from the other side. Again, I'm just playing those advocate. There's two yeah. points to that, right? First Wait, of all, which other side? What I'm talking about the Trump supporters, oh. right? So oh, this okay. is what they were saying. First of all, why are Wait, so why are we sending them aid to begin with? Like, why why is it expected from the U.S. government to help other countries and it's not expected from other countries <coughs> to, like, why is United States government responsible for the well-being of any other people than the well-being of the citizens of its own country? One, that's what they would say. Second of all, they say that um, withholding aid because they, that was actually in the favor of people that were making these trips uh, because... What the government was saying was what the United States government was doing, like, okay, if you right now we are doing all the policing of these migrants, you guys are not doing anything to stop them from making these trips. So we're just going to say, like, we're going to withhold aid unless you do something about it. And if you do something about it, we're going to give you back your aid. Like, something like they were like saying that we they were, they were trying to make these countries actually do something about the uh, uh, migration themselves instead of the United States being like you say like don't you guys want the United States to stop policing other countries that's what we were doing we were trying to make these countries police themselves rather than us going around and policing every single country so that was their argument again i'm not saying any of this is true i'm just telling you what the argument from the other side is but to answer well, your question I about still how, think, like, I the... still think they could have done it without separating families. And th- th- like you, like Susanna said, destroying those children for the rest of their lives, that did not have to happen. Well, another they thing is have... that, another thing, another problem was that they say is that a lot of people, a lot of these migrants w- had the information that if you're with a child, you would have a better case. So they would, they would go get children that were in their own to come to this, they would have pay for people to give them children, lend them so they could rent children so that they could pass the border. And once they get to the border, the United States government had no idea if these were actually their children or not. Uh, and they had to investigate that. And that was very costly and time consuming. And that's why, you know, they couldn't just like, what, what are we supposed to do? Like, just let these children go back into the desert? Like, once you have the children, um, a lot of, and also they all, the Trump supporters also point out Again, I don't know if any of this is true, okay? Please don't hold me against this. I'm just telling you what they say. That what you call pres- what the situation of the children drastically improved once the United States go- government got them. Like, they were going through uh, hell until they got to the U.S. border. And once the U.S., you know, people are like, oh, look, they're cages. Like, okay, like cages, they're air conditioned, they're getting a lot more better quality food, they're getting toys, they're having game nights. Um, and yeah, it's not ideal. The, the, the situation could be a lot better, but it was way, whatever the situation they were, the kids were in was way better than what their parents or so-called parents put them through up until they got to the border. So again, I don't know if any of that is true. I'm just telling you what they're saying. Anyway, so, sorry, Susanna. <laughs> it's well, always I think so much fun to hear you be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always uh, love Armin being the internet's best devil's advocate. <laughs> and then yeah, immediately right. being like, don't hold me to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'm, you> know, <laughs> so to answer your question about um, prison stuff. Um, so, yeah, so basically a lot of these people who, at least in the groups that I was around, they are for prison abolition. Mm. Oof. Um, Yeah. Wow. So that whole idea of being separated through the criminalization process or like Armin said, oh, well, you, what do you want to bring your kids in there with you? You know, that wouldn't even uh. be a thing um, in there. That's what they do in North Korea. 
I... <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah. A lot of them are also for complete, um, like, border abolition. Um, because they also believe that to be a form of familial separation. I have um, I have a zine right here. Wait. Wait, so what did they do? What does the what should they do with criminals if we have no prison? Well, what's their idea? Okay, well here is a uh, material I have called borders prison borders prisons and abolitionist visions. So I'll just read like the first couple sentences. Borders and prisons, walls and cages are global crises. Walls and cages are fundamental to the managing of wealth, social inequities, and opposition to the harms created by capitalism in the present round of neo-colonial dispossession. The work of making and remaking state institutions of citizenship, punishment, and war shapes the human condition in this moment. But what is this moment or what kind of crisis is this global apartheid is one part of the story it is a condition in which the wealthiest nations of regions of the world erect physical and bureaucratic barriers against the movement of people from poorer regions of the world um uh so basically they believe that um like borders and the police exist to protect wealth from being oh. seized like by the proletariat but how did they, but what's their way. alternative like in their minds if they're once they if they have control over society if somebody steals money what are they going to do with them if somebody steals my bike mm -hmm. what's going to happen to them you yeah. would have a restorative justice circle with them. I love how you imitate my body movements. <laughs> <laughs> Armin starts going like, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't think they understand very much about human nature. I mean, what do you do with a sociopath? What do you, you know, do? I'm, and this is where my education in psychology started to butt up against this ideology yeah. and the cognitive dissonance started to come in because I, well, and also I have a fascination with serial killers and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I thought about it, the more I was like, this is just wholly unrealistic and completely impractical. Um, yeah. Although I do believe that we do need prison reform, you know, the yeah. um, the population of the percentage of our population that we have in prison, I do think is a serious problem. Um, yeah. But dissolving it entirely is not going to be an effective answer. And I had a very absolutist and totalistic opinion about it for a long time um, until, you know, you can once you find a single a single thing that 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 will um, that that absolute cannot tolerate the entire absolutist dogma has to collapse. So for me, this is kind of a silly example, and someone who's a prison abolitionist would probably be like, like really pissed at me, or think that this is a dumbass reason to not believe in their movement. Um, but so I'm I really love detectives, and I love detective work and forensic work, and so I'm thinking I'm like. Well, if we get rid of police, how are who who's going to be the detectives? Like, <laughs> you know, like it might be a silly it might be a silly idea, but if we dissolve police departments, like people are still going to get murdered, but who is going to go investigate the murders? Right. <laughs> you know. So, oh, yeah. like, just uh -huh. that single example because of that single example, I could no longer hold that opinion. And mm. again, someone would probably think that that's a really silly or not a legitimate example but i've been i've researched i'm like i want an answer to this question i mean and who's gonna who's gonna go like who's gonna redistribute wealth like if they're communist who's gonna go take the wealth of the so-called rich people and give it to everybody else you need a you need an enforcement method yeah. who's gonna do that and whatever whoever that is that's gonna be your police even if you don't call it police exactly it's gonna be police and Rocky just doesn't work. 
it works <clears throat> in small examples like small situations but if can it be implemented globally i don't think so how do you know there are more how does it work in small examples communism might work in small examples but anarchy doesn't communism and anarchy are contradictions i think like how you yeah. need an enforcement method like how are you going to have like and i don't understand how a lot, a lot of people are communists and anarchists at the same time Who's going to redistribute stuff? How are you guys even going to have a meeting? Who's going to schedule the meeting? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's going to come up Yeah. I mean, effectively, nothing can be done efficiently. Right. And in fact, I think that that's something that they're okay with. Um, there are certain people who I think actually want kind of a de-civilization Mm. Because if you're going to implement this ideology, that's what it requires. Um, and yeah, it's complicated. It's so complicated. I mean, it's yeah. not complicated. It seems very simple. And it seems a con in contradiction to what everything that they seem to stand for. Because they're supposed to protect weak people. Like they say like, oh, clapping is too much because some people might be get triggered. But in an anarchist situation, you have the... Whoever is the most strongest, uh, like might is right, right? Like all the weak people are going to be wiped out, and all the strong people are going to survive, right? So for this, for the people that say like, oh, this minority or this intersectional group or whatever, we need to like make sure we protect them. We, you know, we we don't alienate them, we don't trigger them, we don't hurt their feelings, and all that. If you go into an anarchist method, it's the exact opposite of that. All those yeah. people that you want to protect. They're going to be the first to go. All the people that are the strongest and the, that need the least help, the most. This is the most ableist thing that you could want. Well, what I meant by complicated was the um, the mental gymnastics <laughs> right. to maintain the oh, cognitive yeah. dissonance. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like yeah. to, yeah, um, yeah. So it's oh my gosh. <laughs> and did I ever tell you about how I dated a communist? <laughs> <laughs> No. Girl communist oh or boy God. communist? Huh? Girl communist or boy communist? Wrong assumption, Armin. Neither. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. The the best thing was I went over to their house and I guess all their roommates were communists too. And Wait, I you're actually using their as their pronoun? Is that their is that the person's pronoun? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> And um, I got a peek into their roommate's bedroom, and they had their bedroom decorated in, like, antique Mao Zedong Oof. stuff. <gasps> like, there were, like, these little pillows all over their bed of his portrait and stuff. I was like, what the? <laughs> what is happening here? It was crazy. And um, for the record, I saw a lot of people coming after me in the comments calling me an SJW neo-Marxist, okay? I'm not. I'm recovering. Cut mm. me some slack. <laughs> oh, wait. In the comments of Atheist Republic? Yeah. Oh, come, really? they call me that as well. Don't worry about that. I mean, I don't <laughs> care, but I just... Everybody, every, every, like, a lot of people to the right of me think I'm, like, a social justice warrior, a cuck, whatever... And everybody to like not everybody, but again, a lot of people to the left of me think me, I'm a Nazi, a diet <laughs> Nazi, as they call. So you I never you it. you're I gonna be it. yeah. <laughs> so that's, don't. That's my favorite song. <laughs> Wait, I don't, I don't. You know, when people use they and their pronoun, I think that's the worst pronoun because it's like mm -hmm. it's like a royalty, isn't it? It's like it feels like they're treating themselves like royalty. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, it's bad grammar, and I'm an editor. <laughs> yeah, it's a better alternative. It's more easily accepted than a full-blown neo-pronoun like Z's or, or he, he, here, her, hers. I can, I, How about all it? the full-blown neo-pronouns. Like, it already exists in our language, so it's it's relatively easier for people to use. But it's plural, and it's... It's plural, and it throws everybody off, and it's bad grammar. I mean, there, there are a lot of examples. God, don't make me put on this hat. <laughs> no, put it, put I it on. 
Put it on. Put it on. <laughs> um, so, um, you wait. Yeah, I should put on my, uh, my gender studies crown. Okay. Um, there are lots of examples of us using, like, throughout history, they singularly. Um, mm. I don't Most think... Real- and- Mostly Sorry. royalty. Mostly royalty. <laughs> and I mean, you got a pro with that? <laughs> no, I don't know. For me, and I mean, again, maybe it's just where I live. Maybe it's the communities I've been involved with for a long time. Um, but, and a lot of my friends use this pronoun. Mm. To me, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's not I, a big deal. But it's not also it's also not big of a deal if somebody doesn't use it. Like I don't understand why that's such a big deal for people. Maybe I maybe because I'm not in their position, so I would have understood if they went through all the things that they've experienced and all the discrimination and all that. But right now, with the position that I have, I like I think like if there's so much that the trans or the non-binary community around the world that they're dealing with that is way beyond like oh my god they're not mm-hmm. using the right pronoun like is it really a big crime against them if somebody doesn't use the pronoun that they wish is that the big deal and how could it, how could people know what every single person wants it's not possible to know well, well nowadays you're supposed to always ask basically before you even start a conversation or never. you disclose it in your signature in your email or on your bio and twitter well. or People wear a lot of pins, like, to signify, to advertise it. Um, Oh, I still have the ones that my ex-partner gave me when I was identified as trans and when I was using different pronouns. Um, I still have that. Um, Wait, but do you consider yourself trans? Who identified you? Not anymore. Right. So they miss they they made the, the people that tell you that they shouldn't make assumptions they made the false assumption about you. Is that? Um, people did that's for sure. When I was questioning my gender, people would basically like assume that I wanted to use they them pronouns and use that because when they knew I was struggling with that, they would just like go ahead and use that when that wasn't actually my preferred pronoun. Um, yeah, it's. And I mean, you're right, like, oh, how are people supposed to know, right? Well, that's why they want to abolish the assumption of gender. Well, why is such a big deal? Because, um, and I've been actually trying to find more scholarly and scientific research about this. Um, Especially for transgender youth, um, the constant invalidating of their identity can have really profound psychological impacts. And um, for what, if I gender is not a big deal, why is gender such a big part of their identity? Because it's part of the innately human desire for other people to see you as you see yourself. I don't think that's even unique to being transgender. But if. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing a lot of just hang out with the people that see you the way you want to be seen. Forget the people that don't see you the way you want to be seen. Like, we think it's not just gender. Like, again, I'm a lot of people think I'm a Nazi. Being a Nazi is not part of my identity. A lot of people think I'm a Nazi, okay? Um, And what what I do, I just, okay, you're wrong. The people that don't think about me like that are probably closer to being my friends that are not. Like, people make wrong assumptions about me, for example, all the time, and I think they make more significant... Like, here's the thing. A lot of people tell me that I sound like a Muppet. Um, and it's so not true, because you know who does Jordan Peterson, okay? Right. I need you to stop <clears throat> saying that about yourself. <laughs> no, but it's... I mean, it's, it's fine. I, I Sometimes I call... I remember calling, like, I don't know, IT or something for some company, and they're like... Yes, ma'am. I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not a man, right? <laughs> but what was that? Did that shook me to my core? It didn't. It was like, I didn't even correct him. I didn't even correct him. I was like, whatever, right? Continue the same conversation. I didn't tell, I didn't even bother to tell the person that they were 
that I'm a man, right? I just went on. But I, I think that's a less significant mis- um that was much less significant about my my gender, you know, my identity than people assuming that mm-hmm. I'm pro genocide, right? I think that that misunderstanding about my identity is much bigger deal about who mm-hmm. I am than missing what my gender is, right? If somebody people think like, oh, Armin is pro killing all Muslims, that's a bigger misconception about me than thinking I'm a woman rather than a man, and mm-hmm. that even doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me. Because You're why? So no, I mean, why should it? I mean, I don't understand. Mm-hmm. I mean, why should it bother me? I just, I just have friends that know more about me than people that think I'm Nazi. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think it. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, the, again, back to psychology. Learning how to accept yourself, and if yeah. you accept yourself, and if you're psychologically sound, then nothing like that bothers you. I mean, right. I was. I was a woman in a man's field long before there was any problem with them being chauvinistic. And I mean, the comments I got, but you know what? I had fun with it. I had a blast when they were being that way. And I I could tell who respected me and who didn't. And that's why it bugs me because I've been there, you know, Mm -hmm. all the things they said to me. But I just made, I made fun of it and I laughed with them and then they accepted me and I was one of them. You're, uh, you're, a, scientist. you're, in the, you're a scientist. I was, yeah. yeah. For a couple of years, I worked for the Atomic Energy Commission and I was still in the States and on this uh, test reactor site. And it was a blast. Hmm. And, but, oh, the, oh, I mean, here's one really, really slight thing that happened. That there were these two guys that they were friends, you know, and I, I would just walk down the high aisle, the hall past their doorway and they hollered, Hey Lois, Lois, come here, come here. And I went back and listened to the door and said, Yeah, what do you want? And they said, Why don't you just walk by again? <laughs> <laughs> and I got that constantly. Mm. But I made I turned it into fun. And I had a blast when they were teasing me. And I would just bring it on. Mm-hmm. But I think it's learning how to be comfortable in your own skin. And then when people say or do something, it can't bother you. Mm. Because you know who you are. It doesn't, you don't, it gets to the point where it doesn't matter if somebody doesn't know who you are. I mean, the one person that understood me the least was my mother. Uh, but I think it's, I think if people were found within themselves if if they got if they need psychological help get it you know mm. but if you if you're if you're comfortable in your own skin these things won't bother you right i mean and- they would say that this is like your cisgender privilege that you don't that your that society is not Again, founded around would- the denial of your um self-expression I think they are not comfortable with who they are. I mean, again, the only example I have is being a woman in a man's field when chauvinism was just fine. But I learned how to handle it, and I I had a blast with it. I just... So, you you can't change the world around you, but you can't change yourself. Yeah, I, I will say that the pronoun thing is a way bigger deal who are of the younger generations than people who are of the older generations. Mm -hmm. So for part of my psychology practicum in college, I worked as a, um, I volunteered with an organization that is a um, senior social housing um, nonprofit for LGBT seniors because especially with the Stonewall generation, they never had children, their families abandoned them long ago, all of their community that would have given the support around them was wiped out through the AIDS. So they have some really unique inner, um, some really unique problems for that specific generation of the pre Stonewall generation. And so one of the people that I worked with was a transgender woman who was living in the Tenderloin district. And like, she was in her 70s you know she was institutionalized as a teenager you know like 
yeah. this situation of the pronouns that she doesn't get she doesn't care at all she would tell me about her friends that were murdered mm. you know mm. and i mean that still happens to this day yeah, yeah. but the kids kids around my age you know my generation millennial gen z um they have the privilege of being able to worry about this kind of thing and i mean yeah. there is still assaults that happen i've had multiple friends many friends transgender friends who have been assaulted um mm. almost murdered um and so it still goes on there's no doubt about yeah. that i, I mean deny that. that's horrendous and it's it's unthinkable but i i can't put that together with using the wrong pronoun mm. yeah, i mean i know i'm proportion. from a i'm from a uh, i won't well you guys you got an idea about how far back i go the, the other day um and I know it's it's a generational thing, but yet if it, if it's criminal, if they you know commit a crime, that's terrible, you know. But because of that, I would think that using the wrong word wouldn't seem all that dreadful. Yeah, but but to be fair, I'm not. Um, I mean, I just want to clarify because a lot of people are going to assume that I'm against using the pronouns that people want. I'm, I, I think if somebody tells you, hey, this is my preferred pronoun, I'm not going to be a dick about it. And I suggest other oh, people. Yeah, sure. like, I'm, I'm, like, just, I'm going to use whatever the pronouns they want. I'm going to use whatever mm -hmm. they want because it doesn't. Why wouldn't I? Right. This makes them no, comfortable. I... But, but I'm, 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 I'm personally will use whatever they want. And I suggest other people who don't want to be dicks about it, use whatever they want. But I also don't understand why they lose it. I also, for their own sake, want them to yeah. be more comfortable yeah. if somebody yeah. is mean to them or if somebody mm -hmm. is being a dick to them to get over it and go just find... You don't need the whole world to accept you. You just need a couple of core friends yeah. to accept you. That's all you need, <laughs> right? That's all you need to get by. Well, can yeah, I give they... another example of something else? Um, many years ago, I had some really close friends who were an interracial couple back, you know, when it was less acceptable than it is now. But Ray, he was just this terrific guy, and he was he grew up in West Virginia, and I mean, he went through all of the horrendous, you know, segregation of every kind. But at that point in time, he would say, you know, he couldn't get involved in, in a lot of the, you know, big movements that <clears throat> I can't remember what was going on anyway. <clears throat> uh, but he, he said, you know, I was raised that I was a human being. I wasn't raised that I was black. And <clears throat> what I noticed was people would forget he was black because he accepted himself. And then people around him accepted him. And I remember talking to some people, you know, he wasn't in the group at that time, and they said, Hey, well, you know, Ray really isn't that, he, he isn't that dark colored. And I said, next time you're around him, take another look. He's very dark. But in their mind, they had accepted him so much that they couldn't, they couldn't remember how dark his skin was. Okay, well, that's a problem if accepting me, <laughs> if accepting somebody means rem remembering them that n less dark. <laughs> that's no, 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 what I mean, no. no. <laughs> What oh. I mean is because he accepted himself, right. because he was comfortable in his own skin, it, it was it's... a tremendous help to everybody else to accept him. So it reminds me of some Mormons that say, like, look, as he ex he became a Mormon, he accepted uh, Jesus and everything, and his skin is turning white. Look how is <laughs> like... oh my god, yeah. <laughs> I think to help, this will help illustrate my point. So this is something that a friend of mine wrote. It's called The A-Gender Agenda. Um, Anti-fascist, anar anarcho-queer revolution. Um, oh, where to begin? Transarchism. Um, so what is tranarchy? Um, in its simplest form, anarchy is about breaking down destructive barriers and hierarchies such as class and privilege, but we need to look at more of the intersections of where socially constructed walls divide and destroy us as a society. This includes gender and is a key to queer liberation. Um, 
it's yeah oh my god it goes so deep um yeah yeah f marriage equality um f rainbow painted capitalism we should do a reading of it one time should we <laughs> No nations, no borders, no racism, no xenophobia, no homophobia, no transphobia, no cis normativity, no pigs, no war, no fascists, no gods, no masters. You think no, no pigs? You said no pigs? Oh, three arrows. Yeah. Yeah. Give violence a chance. <laughs> Give violence a chance. Oh. Holy shit. <clears throat> this is a terrorist group. No, this is someone I went to class with. Well, that, and your, I, your friend is a terrorist. I mean, isn't it, isn't that the, isn't that doesn't that fit the definition of terrorism? I mean, if you what is do you have to actually commit the act for it to be considered that way? Well, you could be calling for know. terrorism without actually doing terrorism. I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, well, yeah, I think I think that would be a terrorist because Bin Laden himself didn't do any of the. I mean, is Bin Laden ter- was Bin Laden terrorist? So yeah. So it says trans day of revenge because there's a I, trans wait, guys, day of revenge. I just have to be yeah. clear. Sorry, I'm not saying as soon as you compare things, people think like, oh, are you saying this is as bad as 9-11? No, yeah, yeah. what I was pointing out is that I was trying to give you an, a very ex- extreme example of yeah. you. Might, the person might be a terrorist without actually him pulling the trigger or actually committing violence, right? Um, because you could just be or- an organizer or, you, you know, for example, the people that work for terrorist organization and they make the pamphlets or the website, they're the terrorists as well, even though if they didn't behead anybody, right? So I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just giving an extreme example because I know in the comment section, Armin just, uh, you know, compared the alt-left <laughs> to Al-Qaeda, like, uh, no, okay, just to clarify that one. Sorry, Susanna, go ahead. Um, so here's, like, I think we'll kind of explain the mentality. When, an- when anarcho-queers act or speak in a way that is even remotely aggressive, they are told that pacifism and nonviolence are the only morally acceptable ways to seek revolution, which to me is absolutely ridiculous and hypocritical when us queers are constantly under threat of violence just for existing. I mean, doesn't history show us that the the most successful civil rights movements were the most peaceful ones? Like, isn't that what we have on record? Dr. King, we have Gandhi, yeah, so and what, Mandela. The most, the the three most successful people. I mean, I'm not endorsing everything like Gandhi said and did, but I'm just saying the most, the three most successful examples that we have in history were the people that dead no to violence. We have Mandela, we have Gandhi, and we have Dr. Uh, Dr. King, right? Isn't that the yeah. most? And all of them were like no to violence. But go, sorry. Mm-hmm. So some people, one thing we talked about in the African American history class that I took in college was the comparison of Malcolm X and MLK. Yeah, I knew we were going to say it, that. That's why they like Malcolm well, no, X. No, 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 let me finish. Okay. So what my professor argued in class was that Malcolm X was essential for the success of MLK because in comparison to Malcolm X, MLK was a way better option. So they, it was kind of this idea of the radicals at the end of the day do help because they make the moderates look more um, acceptable. Acceptable, yeah. <laughs> They're admitting that they're so bad. <laughs> Wait, isn't isn't that the self admission of how bad they are? That they make something else look good? You're I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm a thousand percent that, like the radical is necessary to some extent to push. I don't know. I don't know if that modern. because that's just a that's claim. Not my argument, by the way. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Like, we don't know. It's really hard to re-examine history because it's not like a lab that you could remove some yeah. factors and add some factors. I mean, what was the extreme alternative to Gandhi? And I mean, actually, Gandhi had the extreme example. What about Mandela? I mean, okay, technically, you always have. Don't you don't have to worry about that. Okay. When you're coming up with solutions to problems, there are going to be crazies around that have bad solutions to the problem. You don't have to be the part of the bad. You don't have to be part of the problem for the problem to exist. You're like, hey, look, we're so horrid that we're making you look good. You don't have to be part of the horrid people 
The higher people will be there. Don't need to add to that, okay? And I think you're, you know, when you're providing solutions, just provide solutions. Don't make, don't fuck up the world just so that the solutions look better. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> no, I, I, I think the idea should be working towards accepting every human being as a human being rather than, you know, all these, all the different situations. I mean, I, I'm getting into evolutionary psychology, which I think is fascinating. And mm -hmm. if everybody would read Behave, by Robert Sapolsky. I haven't finished it yet, but the world would be better off. I mean, everybody is different. And some, I mean, there's some extremes. And if we just understood that that's who they are, there is no standard. There is no, you know, average. There's a whole spectrum. And if we just accept everybody, accept individuals for who they are, I don't care what they're you know, gender, race, ethnicity, whatever. Just, well, that, that's my big... That doesn't of... work, though, because here's the thing. Okay, so that's what we, that's what they want. That, that would be the ideal situation. But the people that have made a career out of their gender or their race, they don't want race or gender or whatever other biological things to be ignored because they have... You know, for example, this is not just them. I think like this is also any any movement. Like I, I I'm pretty sure once the atheist activist movement grows, um, a lot of people are going to do that with the atheist activism as well. Like the goal should be for atheism not to matter, right? Yeah. We don't want a world where like the whole point of atheist activism is is not to make atheism something front and center. We want to, we want to create a world where the fact that you're an atheist doesn't matter anymore. So that atheist exactly. activism is not necessary anymore. But, but, there, but a lot of activists miss the point. Like, for example, if you want to be a black rights activist, you should fight for a world where being black doesn't even matter anymore. Not, exactly. for, not for a world that, you know, your identity as being black is front and center. But their mm -hmm. counter argument to that is like, well... You can't well to get there. You can't ignore the fact that the disadvantages black people have right now. So you need to make the identity yeah. front and center. I mean, that's. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I I think there's a right way to do identity politics, right? If you say like, "Hey, I am purple, so give me some advantages and privileges." That's the wrong way to do identity politics. But if you say, hey, I am purple and people are after me because I'm purple, please help me. Please mm -hmm. remove this target off of my back. I think that's the right way to do identity politics. No, and I, I think, agree. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people no. are. You know, sorry. It's so ahead. funny to me because, like, the purple and... example is always what they find, like, the most offensive. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh my god, you have no idea. Like they would ream you up the butt right now. <laughs> oh good. Yeah. Why? Oh no. Because you are using like a dynamic that doesn't exist to try to like, like talk about it. it's complicated. It, oh, it, good. I don't even want to get into it. <laughs> Alright, well here's the dynamic that does like, did exist. It's right? like the I don't see color thing. Like No, I'm so saying see no, the hope I'm saying see color when you're when they're using the talk, that color saying. against you. Like if you, I know example, what you're saying. Yes. So here's an example that was real, right? If you if if somebody knocks at your door and you're living in Nazi Germany, okay, and you open the door and the guy says like I'm a Jew, the Nazis are after me, please hide me. I'm not gonna be like I don't care that you're a Jew. Why are you paying identity politics with me? Like who cares that you're a Jew? The guy was like. <laughs> Well, the people that are after me, they care that I'm a Jew. Yes. <laughs> I, I wish I could not care that I'm a Jew, but they care that I'm a Jew. So that's why I care that I'm a Jew, because they're after me because of it, right? So they're forcing me to care about this idea. I wish this was, I wish like being black was not part of my identity. I wish that being white was not part of my identity. I wish being, um, I don't know whatever being male or being female was not part of my identity I, there are more meaningful things that is, makes me me there are more meaningful things that makes me me than these things but other people are forcing me right to care about these things it's not my choice i want to live in a world that none of this is a major part of my identity that's mm -hmm. that's what i think 
Anyway, so I'm not I, completely I totally against agree. identity politics. I'm not completely against identity politics. They're no, way. I've, I've heard you discuss this before, and I really agree. Yeah. <clears throat> that sometimes you have to emphasize it to deal with the immediate problem. Right. You're emphasizing <clears throat> it because of other people are focusing on it, not because you yeah, want to. Exactly. Not because you want to focus on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we hit the one hour mark. So. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna end this here. These are fun. Uh, I like hanging out. Yeah. 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 Okay, we should do them. Uh, I don't know if you guys will be up for it after the whole quarantine situation is over. Right now, a lot more people are like, "Yeah, this is fun." But <laughs> once right. quarantine is over, people are like, "Ah, I'm going outside. I miss the sun." <laughs> so, yeah. No, I'm uh, totally down. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, I mean, no, that won't be my reality for at least another month, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be quite a while. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, All right. thanks a lot. All right, bye guys. Wait, bye. -bye.